Hey guys, so today I figured I would do a quick review video for the Unit 9 test uh, coming up. So I'm just going to work through a couple of the odd problems, uh, not specifically the odd numbers, um, but just some random problems throughout. Uh, ones that I think are super important to focus on for the test. Um, and not that they're all not important, but kind of a, the big concept ones. Uh, so if we look at example number one, and two, and it looks like three. These are all ones that are straight simplifying. They don't have multiplication or, you know, division or anything like that in between. These ones up here are just straight, you know, simplifying. So if we look at the very first example, you always start these problems. And I said a big portion of the test is going to be these problems. So always start these problems by factoring. No matter what, you know, don't try to start eliminating stuff or diving right in factor first. So when we look at this first problem, we're going to go ahead and factor this. And on the top up here, you should get an eight or sorry, X minus eight and an X minus eight. Then you still have that X plus two. On the bottom, uh, this X squared minus 16 is one of those perfect squares. I warned you that perfect squares were going to be a big portion of this. Um, you'll see here's another perfect square. Here's another perfect square. They come up quite frequently, even down here. Here's another perfect square. Um, here's another perfect square. There's perfect squares a lot through this unit. So you need to get comfortable recognizing those perfect squares. Uh, when I factor a perfect square, it basically works out to just be a minus and a plus version. So even if I, if I look over here, this is going to be a minus 5 and a plus 5 a minus and plus version. Uh, this one down here, we'll talk about that in just a second. But if I continue factoring the bottom, uh, you will also get an x minus 8 and an x plus 2. Then it's just a matter of going ahead and eliminating. So this is a minus 8, minus 8. Uh, here's another minus 8, minus 8, plus 2, plus 2. And that only leaves me with this piece right here. Now that piece is on the bottom, so keep that in mind. When I have that piece left over, it has to go on the bottom, but everything on the top got eliminated, which means it's just going to be over top of one. That's as far as simplified as it can get, therefore that's going to be my answer. Now a couple of things to pay attention to in this section, they are asking you to state any restrictions. So a couple of you guys might be like, okay, x cannot equal negative eight. That makes sense because if I plug in negative 8 here, it would give me 0. I can't have 0 on the denominator. Um, but you'll also have to look it back at everything you, you canceled out and make sure you account for those restrictions as well. So over here, I'd say that x cannot be positive 8 because that would give me 0 here and 0 here. Regardless of whether it cancels out or not, you have to account for that restriction. Then you also have this plus 2, so that means I can't plug in a negative 2 or else that would cause a problem. Uh, number two, uh, I'm not going to go ahead and solve that, but I will help you out a little bit. Um, up top here, you should look for the GCF. They both have X's, so go ahead and pull out an X and then ask yourself what's left over. And then you should be able to factor or uh, simplify the rest of that. Example three I did mention has a perfect square in it, but it's a little tricky. Uh, if you try to factor this right now, uh, side note, if you try to factor this right now, you would usually get a 5 minus x and a 5 plus x. Okay, uh, keeping that in mind, there's two different options you can go here. You can either leave it like that and factor the top, which is going to give you an x plus 8 and an x minus 5. This x minus 5 looks very similar to this, but they're just in the wrong order. So this given piece, you can pull out a negative. And that will give you an x minus 5. And then having a 5 plus x left over. When you do this, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, so then you can go ahead and cancel these out, leaving you with an x plus 8 over, don't forget that negative sign, uh, 5 plus x. That would be your answer. That is the correct answer. That would be the final answer. Now, some of you I talked to in class, I mentioned that you can also pull out this negative sign right here at the beginning. 
So if I pull that negative sign out, you're going to get an x squared minus 25, which a lot of you guys are more comfortable with. You know, we had it up here, that x squared minus 25. So then you would factor that to be an x minus 5, x plus 5, uh, still with that negative sign up front. And then when you start canceling, write this up top, you know, you'd cancel this piece, cancel this piece. Your final answer would be an x plus 8 over that negative sign, x plus 5. And I had a couple of people say, hey, these are different. This one has an x plus 5. This has a 5 plus x. Yes, very true. Uh, but if I ask you what's 2 plus 6 and what's 6 plus 2, wouldn't they both be 8? So according to addition rules, it doesn't really matter which one's listed first. It's still going to come out the same. So it doesn't matter whether you have an x plus 5 or a 5 plus x. Still the same answer. So keep that in mind. If I go ahead and state the restrictions, remember you are looking at the denominators. So I would say that x cannot equal plus or minus 5. Or maybe if you like to write it separately, you'd write, you know, minus 5, positive 5. Um, it doesn't matter to me which one you write. But those would be the restrictions, even though in the final answer, obviously you don't really need those restrictions. Uh, if we take a look at, let's do 4. Um, before I mentioned to a couple people, you are allowed simplifying all these canceling out and stuff like that. These are just kind of shortcuts to get to your final simplified answer. So if you look at this one and you say, I want to do 27 times 8, and you'll get this really big number. Um, let me go ahead and calculate that in case you were curious. Uh, 27 times 8 would give me 216. And then on the bottom, you would get 144. You'd also get an x squared, y to the fourth, and a z, because that's everything on the top. And then on the bottom, you'd get a y to the fourth, you know, y and y to the third, y to the fourth, uh, z to the third, and x. That would be everything multiplied together. You can do that. That's perfectly fine. Then you'd look at the 216, 144, and say, how can I simplify those? This would become a 3 and a 2. Uh, over here with the variables, you could cross out this x and this x, making that just x. The y to the fourth and the y to the fourth just completely go away. z to the third z, that would become a z squared. That is perfectly fine. So if you, you want to do that, that's fine. A shortcut method, I would still do it with the variables like this, but a shortcut method would be looking at the 27, 16, 8, and 9 and asking yourself what can simplify out there. So between the 8 and 9, nothing. 27 and 16, nada. Uh, but the 16 and the 8, that can become 2 and 1. The 27 and the 9, that can become a 3 and a 1. It does not matter whether they're, you know, in opposite fractions or not, as long as it's top and bottom. So regardless of where it is, still works. I actually say anytime you see this multiplication symbol, even like with the problem over here, you can go ahead and turn that into one giant fraction. It just kind of eliminates confusion. It's, it's not so much this fraction, that fraction. It's all one giant fraction. So I can go ahead, make that one giant fraction, as long as I remember to factor all of these pieces individually. So yes, you are going to have to factor that piece, then that piece, then that piece. Um, but overall, it's just one giant fraction. The multiplication symbol is really just to kind of show you where it's broken up as far as these three pieces go. Because if I just wrote this whole thing out, you'd think that it was an x squared minus 4x minus 21, x minus 4, and you'd think, what's what? Uh, but by putting that multiplication symbol in, it clearly breaks it up. But you're welcome to just turn that into a line. Uh, real quick, this one down here, it is division. So make sure that you are switching the second piece. Uh, so turning it into multiplication and multiplying it by its reciprocal. So we talked about this when we first learned this, that you know if we have 4 being divided by 1 over 4, it's really equivalent to taking 4 and multiplying it by its that, um, the denominator, the reciprocal of the denominator. So taking 4, multiplying it by the reciprocal, giving me 16. That's what we're doing here. We are changing that division to multiplication and then doing the reciprocal. Um, quick note, side note, I won't solve this problem all the way through. 
But this one is the difference of perfect squares. So if you're trying to factor this, it would just become an A minus B and an A plus B. That's why it's underlined in orange. It was one of our perfect squares. So you need to make a plus version and a minus version. A lot of portion of the test, I warn you, will be on this type of material. Uh, so just keep that in mind when working through some of these. That's why I spend a lot of time on that. Um, and I'll also spend a maybe a lot amount of time on this. Um, however, I, I personally think the questions on the test are a little bit either easier than these ones. Um, but these ones obviously are still good practice. So when you're looking at number seven, I'm actually going to show you a different way that one of my students showed me that I hadn't really thought of. And I love the idea. Um, you can still do it the way we did in class, which is finding that LCD, putting everything over it. But the shortcut way that she showed me was that if you take a minus four over three on both sides, totally legal, you know, just moving it to the other side, you're going to get 10 over 2x plus one equals uh, this two. In order to take two minus four over three, we are going to have to either calculate it on your calculator or make this two into a six over three. Um, so it's 6 over 3 minus 4 over 3, which gives me a total answer of 2 over 3. And then, similar to the problems um, that we had on the other worksheet, I don't see any on this particular one, um, but this is just becoming one fraction equals another, so we can now do cross multiplication. So if I cross multiply, that's going to give me 30, for the first piece, equals 2 times 2x plus 1. And then you just have to solve for x. Uh, so that would give me 4x plus 2. I bring the 2 over. That's going to give me 28 equals 4x. Divide both sides by 4, giving me final answer 7 equals x. Um, you'll notice in the directions it just says check for restrictions. You don't have to list the restrictions. Um, but if you did at the beginning and said, hey, x cannot equal 1 half. My answer did not equal one half, so that does not conflict. I have nothing to worry about. If it does conflict, that's when you get those no solutions. Uh, example eight, nine, and 10 are all exactly the same. Um, they're kind of strategically planned. So if you look at this piece right here and you say, okay, let me factor it. So you're gonna get an X plus three X minus two. Look at that, they match the denominators over here. Same thing will happen when you factor these ones. Conveniently, they all work out to be exactly what the left side is. But when you're looking at this and you say, what is going to be my LCD? It's going to be both pieces. As I said, anytime you have addition or subtraction in the bottom, you need that. These are both addition and subtraction, so you need both pieces. So keeping that in mind, I'm trying to put everything over this x plus 3, x minus 2. Um, this is another just a shortcut. You're trying to put everything over that, so you might as well just draw one giant fraction, kind of saves you time. Um, but when you're looking at the first piece and I say, I want to put it over top of this, but it started out with only an x plus 3. How did I go from x plus 3 to an x plus 3, x plus minus 2? Because I tacked, I multiplied it by x minus 2. So on the top here, this 14, I'm also going to have to multiply by an x minus 2. Then I look at the second piece and I say, okay, originally it started out with only an X minus two, but now it has both of these pieces. So what did I do? I multiplied it by an X plus three. So I had to do that on the top as well. Multiply it by X plus three. And then the last piece, so equals, this last piece over here, it's already over an X plus three and an X minus two. Therefore, I don't have to multiply this top by anything. It's just 122. At this point, uh, the denominators would kind of cancel out because they're on both sides of the equal sign. Uh, if you wanted to see that, obviously this side over here would also be over an x plus two, and then you'd say, let's multiply both sides by x plus three, x minus two, and everything would cancel out. So just kind of take my word if you want to explore that one day. Um, if you have some free time, go for it. But ultimately the denominator goes away. I saw at the top, you're gonna get 14x minus 28 plus 10x plus 30 equals 122. Combine your like terms, that gives you 24x plus 2 equals 122. 
Uh, and then all of a sudden, and you have algebra one, and I'm going to pause there and let you finish that. Um, but in the meantime, like I said, this is exactly what you want to do with these problems. When you factor this, lucky guess, it's going to be 2x minus 1 and an x plus 4. Because like I said, it's going to tally up to be exactly the same. If I come down here and factor this, lucky guess, it's probably going to be x minus 2, x plus 1. So those you will do exactly like you did in number 8. Moving on to the back side, these word problems. Um, these word problems are the variation types. I want you to take close, close notice to the directions, and this is exactly how it will appear on the test. It says part A, clearly state the K value. Part B, write the new equation. That means write the new equation with the K value plugged in, and then solve for the desired value. There are three pieces here. So a lot of you guys lost points on that quiz because you forgot to rewrite the equation. And right there is one point off. So don't make those mistakes on the test. So if I go ahead and look at, let's do the first problem. I look at the first problem, it says, uh, a, to balance a seesaw, the distance d, that's the first variable I see, a person is from the fourth row, is inversely proportional. So now it says inversely, that's my keyword. Um, inversely meaning it's going to be a fraction. So it's going to be on the denominator, inversely to their weight. So that's what it says. Now it says Roger, who weighs 120 pounds, so that's his weight, 120, is sitting six feet away from the fulcrum. Six feet. So what's K value? That just tells me multiply by 120 on both sides. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it gives me a K value of 720. Um, on your test, it actually asks you to box or circle your final answers for each of these three parts. So this would be part number one. It's boxed in. I clearly see the K value. You have nothing to worry about. You won't lose a point because right there is your K value. Then part C is rewrite your equation. So go back up to this equation you start with. D equals, we now know what K is, 720 over W. Part B. Took me a second to do. But yet, if you don't do it, you'll lose a whole point, okay? Once I have part B done, I want to go ahead on to part C, which is solve for the desired thing. They say that Ellen weighs 180 pounds. So they're telling me the weight. So I plug that in for W. They want to know how far away she is, so that would be distance. So I go ahead and solve for D. I'm going to get 6.7. However, I am not done. Notice how I didn't box it. Because the directions, not necessarily in this packet, but it will say it on the test, also say to include a unit. The distance for the original Roger was six feet. So this is also going to be feet. Now that's my final answer. And I can go ahead and box that in. So make sure you have those three pieces. I can't stress it enough. Uh, if we look at a couple of other, the other problems along here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the very last problem. Uh, some reason I jumped to this very last problem is when you're reading this, it says the maximum load, let's call that L, of a beam is supporting uh, varies jointly. So the second you see varies, you need to have an equal and a K. Varies jointly with the width and the square of the height. So when I take height, I need to square it. And inversely, so divide by the length. Let's make that lowercase l. That's going to be my equation right there. Then it's just a matter of plugging in the known information. So it says um, the beam is six meters long. So that's going to be my l, my little l. So I'm going to have six meters long on the bottom. Uh, 0.1 is my width. So I'm going to plug that in. 0.1 is my width. My height is 0 0.06. Don't forget that piece individually is squared. Don't square the point 0.1, just point six, point zero six. Um, And then it says it supports 360 kilograms. At this point, it is just a matter of typing your calculator. I personally would start with the point zero 0.06 squared, times it by point 0.1, divide all of that by 6, 
and then divide 360 by whatever value you get. So when I do this, you're actually going to get a K value of, and don't be alarmed when you see this, uh, 6 million. Yes, that K value is quite large, but very accurate. Then I go over here, part B says plug it in. So I'm going to go ahead and plug it in. Yes, it's going to be a long one. Uh, w, H squared over L. But that's still my equation, and I still need to have it. If you don't have it, you'll lose a point right there. And then I go to my final, and it says find the uh, load that it can hold. Uh, so I take that 6 million. And then I'm going to go ahead and times it by 0.2. And then a 0 0.08 squared, running out of a little room. And then divide that full amount by 16. Then it's just a matter of typing in your calculator. You should get 480 kilograms. Don't forget the units. Okay. So that's kind of what you're doing with the word problems. Um, try your best. Just to remember, a couple of you guys missed this on the quiz. Don't forget when you see that word square, it needs to have a square on it. So just keep that in mind. Don't let that part mess you up because if you don't put the square, it will give you totally wrong numbers. Uh, graphing. These ones are probably my favorite. Uh, so you can pretty much be guaranteed that there will be a couple of these on the test. Um, these ones are fun, in my opinion, very quick and easy. You look at the denominator and you say, what's my restriction? Okay, I know that X cannot be two. If X cannot be two, then that means that there's going to be a vertical asymptote at two. Notice how nothing canceled out. So that this isn't regarding to holes. That doesn't even say anything about holes up here. It's just talking about vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So I'm going to have one at two. So I go ahead and kind of do that dashed line along here. The horizontal asymptote is actually going to come from this piece right here. That is going to be what my Y is. So I'm going to have a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative 2. That one doesn't get flipped. So keep in mind, this one does become, goes from negative 2 to plus 2, positive 2. Um, this one on the outside doesn't get flipped. It just stays as is. Once you have that done, it's really just a matter of, you know, we said if it's positive, it's going to be in the first and third quadrant. And then if it's negative, it's going to be in the second, I don't know why it went to non-Roman numerals, uh, second and fourth, yes, fourth, second and fourth quadrant. This one is negative. You'll see the negative sign out front there. That means I need to be in the second and fourth quadrant. Those shapes, I'm not looking for anything specific like, oh, does it go through this point or that point? It doesn't really matter to me. Um, as long as it's somewhere in there. So if your graph goes, you know, maybe your graph goes down a little bit more, maybe your graph is closer to the line, it doesn't really matter to me. If it looks something like this, uh, that I would not accept. That I would totally take off points for. Um, but it should be some type of curve running along the axis. So I'll show you how quick one of these can go by. I look at this one and I say, okay, x cannot equal negative one. So I go to x equals negative one. There's my first asymptote. Then I look at the negative 2, and I say, okay, that's going to be my y equals negative 2. So then I go to my y equals negative 2, and I draw on the line. Boop, 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 boop. Okay. Then I say, okay, this is positive. That's spelled wrong. Uh, positive. There we go. Um, positive meaning I'm going to be in the first and third quadrant. So I whip two little curves in here, done. That's all you gotta do, that's all I wanna see. I wanna see those two asymptotes clearly drawn in. If you wanna do it with the colored pencil on your test, that's fine. Um, and then I wanna see those curves. I would recommend, and I want it to take off points this, uh, be careful that your curves aren't going like, woo, something crazy like that. They should continue to run along your asymptote. Um, so mine was kind of a little on the edge there. Uh, just be careful with that. They should just run along your asymptotes. But never cross them. If you touch the asymptote, I will take off points for that. All right, going on to the next graphing page. Um, oh, and by the way, for these ones back here, I would highly recommend a little secret for the test. Um, for anyone who gets to watch this video, here's your little secret. 
Once you have it graphed like this, go grab the graphing calculator, type this in, remembering to, you know, use parentheses around this. Uh, even if you want to be super, super safe, I would even put parentheses around this part as well. Um, so if I showed you how it was typed in your calculator, I'd say, you know, you're in your y equals window, do parentheses and do minus four, divide it by another set of parentheses, x minus two, and then close that parentheses. That tells it all that, hey, this is one giant fraction. Once you're done dealing with that giant fraction, minus two. That would be how you would graph it on the calculator. Um, and by graphing it on the calculator, it will allow you to see if you actually plotted them in the right space. They don't have to be exact, so don't worry about making them exact. But if you type this in and for some reason it spits out curves in the other, you know, maybe it spits it out in the first and third quadrant, then maybe check where you drew it, okay? And double check that your window's cracked because if you feel like this is all right and you type this in and for some reason it doesn't give up, check your parentheses because it is a very big deal for the calculator if you don't use the parentheses. And that will, it might not even create a curve. It could create a whole new shape if you don't use parentheses. So make sure you use parentheses when typing that into your calculator. These ones do require you to type them into your calculator. Um, so the first thing that it mentions is find those vertical asymptotes. So when I'm looking down here, I'd say that x cannot equal 0 and x cannot equal 6. Those are my, you know, restrictions, you could say. Then I would also take notice that the x's cancel out. So what does that tell me about this x equals 0? It tells me that it's a whole. This piece did not cancel out, so it tells me it's a vertical asymptote. So I should graph the vertical asymptotes first. So I go to x equals 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Here is my vertical asymptote. Um, and then the whole will just come about when you do your graph. Uh, this one, you would have to use a graphing calculator. Um, so I would say type this into your calculator. Um, when you're typing it in, this is what I'd type in. So you'd have be in your y equals button. So hit the y equals button. Type in x divided by. And instead of typing exactly what you have here, I would actually distribute that and make it an x squared minus 6x. Then in your calculator, all you have to do is remember parentheses and type in x squared minus 6x, close parentheses. That way the calculator doesn't get any, any confusion. It will actually spit out, and then you'll hit graph. You'll hit graph and it'll spit out an image similar to this. And then another one, another curve over here. At this point, uh, if you're looking to figure out how to fill in the table, you would want to go under second and then hit the button graph, and it'll bring up a large amount of values. Pick any, really, honestly, um, it's not a big deal to me. Uh, if you see, you know, if you're looking at the answer key online, I picked even more values than boxes. Um, I just kind of went for whole numbers, like all these whole numbers in here. Well, they're not whole numbers, but they're reasonable decimals. Um, point 0.1, I could probably graph that. Point 0.5, I could graph that. Um, so just kind of picking some numbers you could graph, but that would be how you would do ones like this. It would allow the calculator to do a much more of the work. Pretty much the only work that we had to do was finding that VA. Um, the whole at zero, all I'd have to do is put a little open circle. Wherever my graph, everyone's is a little, a little different, wherever your graph crosses it, put a little hole there. That's it. That's all you got to do for those ones. At number 17, you will have to pull out a two and then factor it. Um, Pull out the two first, so this would look like a 2x squared plus 5x plus 6, then factor it. A couple of people got confused when I wrote this out, and they're like, well, I can't jump straight into factoring. Uh, you want to pull out the two first and then try to factor. Much easier. Oh, there's one of those perfect squares. Told you they were going to be everywhere. Uh, the last one, just because I don't want this to be too long, uh, these ones up here, is exactly how it'll appear on the test. Um, all you basically do is read this. So you have A varies means having an equal and a K. That's what varies stands for. Directly meaning multiplication with B and inversely with C. So inversely meaning divided by C. That's my equation. Then you just go plug in this A, B, and C. That would give me four equals 
K2 over 6, solve for K. So that would become 24 equals 2K, divide 12 equals K. Fill that in the first blank, 12. Equation stands for taking this piece up here. This A equals, plug in your K, so that's 12B over C. That's the equation. Can't really do anything without the equation. Now that I have the equation, I can go on and say, what is the B value when A is 13 and C is 12? So I'd go ahead and take this equation right here and say A is 13. I have my K value. I don't know what B is, but I know that C is 2. I then solve this and get 26 equals 12B. And then all I'd have to do is divide both sides by 12. Um, Sorry, not 26. Yes, 26. I had to think for a second. Uh, 26, and I actually realize now, um, I pause only because, and you'll probably notice this on your answer key, when I set this up and I did 12 times 13, uh, I should have been 26 right here, uh, which would actually change my final answer. Uh, if I do 26 divided by 12, would actually give me a decimal value of 2.17. Uh, so a small little error on my answer key, uh, which means I should just come over here and make this a 2.17. Um, I guess if I wanted this to be 36, I should have made that 23. Uh, but that's okay. I did this on the fly during keystones. Uh, but yes, so it's just a matter of solving for that final variable, um, being careful like that. Uh, I rushed through that, so I probably shouldn't have rushed. Uh, but so this one, you'd get that value, plug that in over here, 2.17. Um, that doesn't need units. This one doesn't need units because it's just talking about letters. Uh, this final one down here does, in fact, need units. Um, so if you see, I got 120 feet because the A was referring to area in cubic feet, that type of deal. Um, but again, these are on Canvas, so you can check them out. Hopefully that helps you a little bit with the problems. Um, these ones, these variation ones, as long as you remember that direct means multiplication, inverse means divide, and jointly means that you have multiple multiplication going on. So jointly and directly are pretty much the same thing. It's just Directly only has one thing, like I'm directly giving you money. There is no middleman. There's not multiple pieces. Versus jointly, there's all these different pieces. Money's going to A, then B, then C. It, everything. There's multiple, um, multiple variables. Which you'll notice in the equation, it will actually just work out that way. Like even if the word jointly wasn't said, you're given a length, width, and height. So you need all of those pieces. So clearly it's not going to be direct. It's going to be jointly. Um, so as long as you're comfortable with that, definitely be comfortable with these types of graphs because, like I said, I love them, so good chance they're going to be on there. There are two of the word problem ones, these word problems that we talked about here. There's two of those. And then the rest of the test is a lot of problems with the uh, solving for the variables. Um, there's some where it's two and then an equal sign to solve for x. There's some that are kind of like this where you have to do cross multiplication. Um, and then there's a section that has these kind where you are just simplifying and then a third section that has these ones with the uh, multiplication and division and all the stuff like that. So hopefully this helps. Um, again, feel free to watch anything over. I'll be in class tomorrow if you need any help, but hopefully this will be an easy test to make up for that log test. All right. See ya.